now we have uh, Dr. Andrew uh, Coates with us. Uh, Andrew is a research fellow with the School of Geography and Environmental Sciences at Monash Uni. He graduated with a PhD in March 2008 in the area of climate, oh, sorry, urban climate ontology at Monash University. Previous to that, he was at DSC and uh, Office of Water. His research interests is something that I want to focus on here include urban land atmosphere interactions, urban heat island mitigation and climate change adaptation in cities, sustainable water management, microclimate and human health, and urban planning for improved climate and thermal comfort. And so Andy's going to talk or focus his talk on the work he's doing with the uh, Centre for Water Sensitive Cities in a project what they call B3, Green Cities and, and Microclimate. So please help me welcome Dr Andrew Coots. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak. I spoke spoken a couple of times uh, once to Stormwater Victoria and Clearwater three or four years ago. Um, so hopefully today I'll be able to present a bit of the stuff that we've been working on for the last few years and sort of where our thinking's going. Um, this talk will be a little bit theoretical, but I'm hoping it'll be really practical as well. Um, so I'm going to talk about stormwater and human thermal comfort benefits in the urban landscape. Um, so here we are, uh, that's me in the blue shirt and a student of ours in Wilson Lakes standing next to a nice um, constructed wetland, uh, standing under the shade of the tree enjoying it, you know. So how, does, how do we create spaces that are thermally comfortable and, and good um, for human health? Uh, that's what that's what we're interested in in the uh, CRC. Uh, just to quickly acknowledge the the team. Uh, not everyone's at uh, Monash anymore, but you know we've had people progressing through the uh, the team over the last few years. So just acknowledging everyone there. Um, so I'll quickly well, I'll, I'll spend a bit of time on uh, background, just talking about um, urban heat and the urban heat island. Um, and sort of differences between them. Um, I'll talk about uh, mitigating excess heat exposure through um, stormwater harvesting and water sensitive urban design. I'll spend a bit of time talking about human thermal comfort, what that is, how we measure it, um, and then the rest of the talk I'll talk about um, some examples of the research we're doing as part of the CRC and some, some of the findings that we're or a few snippets of the, the findings that we're getting out of that. So hopefully that will be interesting. So if we start with the um, figure at the top, uh, the urban heat island. So lots of you probably would have seen a, um, a figure like this. Um, so uh, there's two things that are really being displayed in this figure. One is the urban heat island itself. So that that idea that urban areas are warmer than the surrounding countryside. Um, so this, this figure is really a snapshot in time. So it's taken at 1 a.m. the 23rd of March 2006. Um, and so it shows a, a four degree temperature difference, a maximum four degree temperature difference at, at that point in time. Um, and there's a whole bunch of uh, reasons that are influencing that, um, such as uh, the so the design of it's mainly through the design of the urban landscape. So during the day, um, you get a lot of solar absorption, absorption of solar radiation um, in mat urban materials um, that have high heat capacities. Um, so that energy gets stored and then slowly released at night. Um, and you've also got um, lots of trapping of heat um, within the urban landscape. So if you look, take this sort of um, street canyon environment, as we would call it. Um, at night, um, the heat gets sort of trapped in there. Um, radiation off buildings can't escape easily. Um, you've got restricted ventilation. All these sorts of things contribute to um, um, the, the microclimate at that particular point. The other thing that this figure at the top is showing is the spatial variability of urban heat. So um, you have this sort of heat island phenomena, which is um, sort of you observe across the whole city, but across that you've got a lot of variability at, at a local to micro scale, and that's influenced by all of these factors as well. So how much vegetation cover is there? Um, 
yeah, what's the albedo of the surfaces, all these sorts of things influence what's, what kind of microclimate um, that you might experience at a single point. Um, so um, Rod's talk, I think, led in really nicely to this, so thank you for that. Um, so when we're talking about a heat health outcome, so whether um, there's um, mortality or mo morbidity depends on, on a few things. So uh, a person's vulnerability, so things like their age, um, th whether they have pre-existing med medical conditions, um, their ability to adapt um, to heat, so whether they can move to a more comfortable place, so drinking enough water. Um, and then we have exposure, so what, what kind of climate or temperature are these people experience, um, exposed to? And that's influenced by sort of the regional synoptic conditions, so whether you've got a sort of a heat wave condition coming through, um, and also the, the variability that's driven by the urban development itself. So you sort of have this, this over, overarching um, heat wave and then variability within that um, influenced by urban development or the type of urban development. Um, so in terms of stormwater management and water sense of urban design, it sort of um, looks at this, this area, this channel, in, towards reducing exposure. Um, another slide that I often like to put up is this, just to provide a bit more context, is around this idea of um, scales in urban climate. So when we look at the mesoscale or the city scale, um, you're looking at um, large-scale processes. Um, this is kind of the, the scale at which we think of the urban heat island, so this sort of um, urban versus rural contrast. And then if we go right down to the micro-scale, um, it's sort of looking at um, right down to that sort of street scale. Um, and so here's a, just an example from uh, in Mawson Lanks where we did some bicycle transects around. Um, this is during the day. Um, and you can see that there's, even just at this kind of scale, there's a lot of variability um, driven by a whole bunch of things, but partly um, what kind of surfaces or what kind of um, development is uh, influencing here. And so this, um, at this scale, uh, during uh, this daytime image, um, or this daytime data, there was a, a two degree temperature range here in this example. Um, one of the transects we did at night, um, there were temperature differences up to four degrees. So we're seeing the same kind of variability at the micro scale as you see at the citywide heat um, mesoscale, uh, which is important because it just shows that how you, that it, it um, at the micro, you can influence the micro, the, you can influence the climate at the micro scale. Um, so just, just to sort of expand on that a bit, um, and this idea of the urban heat island, um, getting into semantics a little bit here, um, but I think it's important to kind of understand and, um, and sort of shifting sort of some of our language around what we're talking about here. So, um, hopefully I'm, you're all with me where I'm up, where I am now. But, um, so when we talk about the urban heat island, it's really this sort of city scale phenomena. Um, and when we say that it's an urban heat island of four degrees, we're really referring to that, that sort of maximum um, versus rural temperature difference. So it's quite a, a specific thing that we're talking about. Um, and it does, um, it's, it manifests itself largely at night time, or that's when, it's, uh, that's when the maximum is, because um, you get that, that heat storage during the day, and then that slowly gets released at night in urban areas, whereas in a rural area, the, it can cool really rapidly. Um, it's largest under clear and calm conditions, and the intensity, so say the difference between the urban and the rural area, is as much about what the rural area is what's going on in the rural areas it is in the, in, the, in the central area. So if it's dry out here, it might cool really rapidly. Um, or if it's forested, you know, you, you might have a, 
The temperature can remain the same here, but depending on what you choose as your rural location will determine the urban heat island intensity. Um, and urban cool islands can exist, so at times the CBD area can be cooler than rural areas, depending, again, what you're using as your reference. So, um, so the point I'm trying to get to here um, is that it's really the variability across the landscape that we're trying to address here. So it's about um, mitigating high heat exposure. So when you look at that, that microscale picture I had up before with the, in Mawson Lakes with the small, you know, it's, that, it's those areas of high heat exposure that we want to target. So for instance, um, I guess I'm getting this just because of some of the interactions with local councils that we've had. Um, so you might have a, a council out here that's got an urban heat island mitigation plan or something and they're, they're good at really reducing their, their urban heat island um, but people will still take that sort of CBD to rural difference and so you might have this cool area here but the urban heat island's still there. So we're talking about reducing urban heat exposure um, irrespective of whether there's an urban heat island or not. Okay, I've made my point, so <laughs> I hope. I hope that everyone can that. So here's what we're talking about theoretically in terms of reducing high heat exposure. So lots of implementation of water sensitive urban design, stormwater harvesting, irrigation at the micro scale to deliver benefits at the local scale. Um, and so, you know, these wetlands and those sorts of things. Um, all increasing evapotranspiration, um, reducing land surface temperatures, and generally providing uh, a more comfortable um, thermal experience in the urban environment. So if you implement at the micro scale and target high areas of high heat exposure, it will feed up towards reducing the urban heat island overall. Um, so just moving on to, so there's, um, so, so far I've been talking about sort of air temperatures, um, but the thing that we're also um, interested in is about reducing thermal comfort. So it's just not, it's not just the nighttime temperatures that we want to reduce, we just want to provide a better thermal experience over the entire day, um, whether it's night or day, whether there's an urban heat island or not. Um, so there's a whole bunch of sort of um, thermal comfort measures that, that are around that describe um, sort of your physiological experience of the climate. Um, and it's influenced by things like your body parameters, like your height and weight, um, your age, your sex, um, and then also these other environmental parameters like the air temperature, the humidity, the wind speed, and also what's called the mean radiant temperature, which is um, sort of the energy loading on your body from solar radiation or radiation off, you know, hot walls or whatever. Um, and so when you're walking through this kind of urban environment, you're going to experience a whole range of thermal comfort um, sensations, if, if you like. So um, whether you're in Fed Square or over over here in the park, you're going to have a, a very different um, thermal comfort experience. And it's about, um, so we're trying to improve the thermal comfort in, in as much of a, a broad area as we possibly can. Um, so as I said, there's a whole range of different indices that describe human thermal comfort. One of those is or well, there's two here, um, standard effective temperature, SET, or physiological equivalent temperature, PET. Um, and so, say you're out in the sun, it's um, 30 degrees, um, your physiolo physiological equivalent temperature might be 43, which better kind of better describes what you're experiencing out there. Um, and so then these, these Temperatures can be related to a thermal sensation. So if, it's, if the um, standard effective temperature is, say, 17 to 30 degrees, then you're comfortable. And so um, in Melbourne, uh, Margaret Lufton, from, who's part of the CRC, has done, done interviews to try and work out what, 
whether or not this sort of scale fits with the thermal sensation in Melbourne. Um, she found that uh, people who were sitting had an effective temperature of 21.8 and they were comfortable, so that sort of fits in that range. Um, and people who were walking, so they're active, they're moving around, um, so their body temperature is going to be warmer. They had an effective temperature of 25.9, um, which is still in that comfortable range, but the 75th percentile is starting to get into this slightly warm aspect. Um, so this kind of helps us to set targets for what we want to achieve with implementing um, green infrastructure and stormwater harvesting and that sort of thing. I'm going to skip that. So we, um, we published a paper uh, at the end of last year called Watering Our Cities and so forth. Um, I can provide you a copy with this if you like. Um, and it was a big literature review um, on you know, what, what implementing water sensitive urban design and stormwater harvesting can do. So we, the conclusions out of that were basically that we should, um, when we implement WUSID stormwater harvesting, we need to maximise the cooling potential of green infrastructure first. So we've got green spaces out there, but it's important that they're, they're irrigated. Um, so they're actually providing um, evapotranspiration, um, or they're transpiring at least, to cool. And they're also, in terms of trees, we have really healthy canopies so that they're providing the maximum amount of shade possible. Um, we should target dense urban environments with little or no vegetation. So these environments tend to be areas of high heat exposure. Um, and it's important that if we are implementing in those kind of environments which are particularly warm and dry that the vegetation is well irrigated so it can cope with what can be quite stressful urban conditions for vegetation. Um, we need to harness the, the cooling potential of trees um, so trees in particular reduce provide the shading benefit and so you get a reduction in radiant temperatures um, which is um, the most important um, influence on thermal comfort during the day. Um, we need to aim for many smaller distributed technologies at regular intervals. So as you saw with that micro, that micro scale example, if you're, you could be walking down what's quite a dense street, um, and there might be a park in the next street, but um, because of the, the barrier of the buildings, you might not actually be getting any benefit from that park. So we need to distribute um, irrigated green spaces throughout and trees throughout the landscape. Um, and we need to work with the built environment to extenuate um, cooling influences. So, um, you know, orienting streets to um, down, so that, so say you've got a park up the north, orient the street north-south so that the cooling influence can penetrate through the, um, the street, things like that. Um, so, we've been doing a whole bunch of, bunch of observations, um, remote sensing and getting towards some modelling as well um, as part of the CRC to try and say, um, well, how much benefit do you get um, and also help us to sort of provide more guidance around Im implementing these sorts of things. Um, so, I'll talk about a few of those today. Um, how much, what time do I have to finish? How long have I got? Okay, at least. So, uh, quickly, where uh, we undertook this uh, experimental green roof project, um, where we had these um, three rigs. We had a vegetated roof, um, one without with soil but no vegetation, just a conventional one. Um, and what we have here is just um, well, the blue line is evapotranspiration. Uh, the black line is sort of total amount of uh, energy. Um, the red line is atmospheric heating and the green line is um, heat storage into these, into these different rooftops. <coughs> um, and basically the vegetated roof is an unirrigated roof and so there's a whole, not really a whole lot of um, evapotranspiration happening off here um, and, and a lot of energy being used in heating the atmosphere. So if we want to get benefits from green roofs, um, we've, tended, we've found that actually irrigating the roof is an, is an important 
um, feature. So we, we actually did an irrigation example, uh, irrigation experiment, and we more than doubled the amount of evapotranspiration when we irrigated the roof. I mean, it's common sense, really, but um, you do get a benefit from green roofs through the reduction in um, heat storage, but we can maximise, again, referencing that, you know, maximise the, the green infrastructure by irrigating it. Um, just to, for a comparison, we also had a white roof, um, so high reflectivity, and we actually found that there was a really large reduction in the amount of atmospheric heating that we were getting from those roofs. So um, probably a, a good approach there, um, and you really need to irrigate the green roof, just try and start getting the kind of benefit you're going to get out of that roof compared to that roof. Um, as part of the Vicar project, um, we did some thermal mapping. Um, this just again demonstrates the benefits of vegetation. So we've got these nice irrigated ovals um, compared to the surrounding sort of unirrigated grass areas. You're seeing these large surface temperature reductions. Um, so that will translate um, to some extent to a reduction in air temperatures during the day. Um, but also you have a, a change in the, um, the radiation that you're getting off the, off the ground as well. I'm, I'll keep moving. Uh, we did an experiment uh, at the Footscray Primary School. Um, an honour student did some work out there um, to look at the influence of green, um, irrigation on um, cooling effects of green spaces. Um, so we had two irrigation events, one here and one here. Um, we've got soil moisture up on the, on the y-axis. Um, and obviously you get this large increase in soil moisture. Um, and then if I've she also measured uh, land surface temperatures as well. And we had, a, we had a control dry patch, which is the red line. And then these, these uh, irrigated areas, of course, are showing this large temp surface temperature reduction. We were also looking at um, trying to look at the cooling influence of those um, of that space, um, but we found it quite difficult with the approach we used um, to, to capture the, the change in air temperatures. Um, we also did a street tree study um, that compared three different streets. So we had some, some of these weather stations in uh, Burke Street, Gipps Street, uh, which is in East Melbourne, and George Street, which is also in East Melbourne, um, and looking at the microclimate in each of these street environments. Um, so George Street had a 45% um, tree canopy coverage compared to just 12% at Gipps Street and Burke Street. Um, the vegetation there was sort of two sections, so the vegetation was in 42 and, and 20 in each other section, um, but really a dense, dense canyon. Um, I'm going to skip down to here. Um, actually, I'll show you this one. So uh, during a heat wave event, we had um, this blue line is the Burke Street. Um, red line is the Gip Street with no trees. And the green line is George Street with trees. Um, you can see this massive influence of the buildings on the, micro on the air temperatures uh, in Burke Street um, and sort of overwhelming the influence of any trees there. Um, but if I jump to, so this is, just look at the, don't worry about the, the um, green and red line, but look at the black line and that's just the difference between Gipps Street, which was no, had few trees versus George Street. Um, which had a lot of trees. Um, and we were seeing um, a, a marginal benefit during the day um, on air temperatures um, in, uh, in George Street, so of half a degree or so. So we were, you can see a benefit there, but we're a little bit disappointed. Looking at in, um, individual trees, so this is looking at PET, that physiolo physiological equivalent temperature. Um, and the different levels of heat stress associated with those temperatures. <clears throat> um, so if you look at the red line, that is, this is over that heat wave period in February 2012. The red line is the average PET 
um, in Gipp Street where there were no trees. And then I've got a couple of lines just representing different um, individual stations that we had in, in other streets. Um, but just look at the green line, that's just a, a station that was under a dense canopy. And so through the shading, m mostly, um, you can reduce that heat stress level um, from extreme heat stress down to sort of strong heat stress. So you're still heat stressed, but you know, um, you're improving that thermal comfort level. Um, I, might, I might just finish with this one, um, seeing I'm running out of time. Uh, so we're moving into doing some uh, uh, modelling work um, to try and look at different scenarios of, of, of greening. So we've, we've found it really hard to sort of capture the, the influence of um, green spaces and the microclimate. It's really complex. Um, there's lots of things that influence the temperature at a particular point. Um, so there's the adjacent surfaces that influence that temperature. Um, so the adjacent, so the, the, the wetland or the rain garden that you might have nearby, that's going to influence that. But there's also, you know, the larger scale, larger scale um, climate um, affecting that the, the climate at that point, plus other features like buildings, etc. So um, we've got a PhD student working on a on a microclimate model, um, who's going to take this radiation model and put vegetation and uh, water balance in there and then run these kind of different um, different scenarios to try and look at what the benefit's going to be on um, thermal comfort and air temperatures. So just to finish, um, um, so if we, if we want to meet these sort of climate sensitive design objectives, we need to, to irrigate a lot more. Um, it's important that we irrigate with sustainable source, sources like stormwater especially under times of um, reduced water availability. We need to promote trees and they need to be irrigated um, because of the, 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 high, the benefits that we get um, to thermal comfort. Um, and we need to design the green infrastructure into the landscape. So as I said before, we need to distribute it, um, focus on areas of higher solar radiation. And I'll just, last slide, finish with a plug uh, for a, um, our colleague Margaret Luffnan who's did lots of work on mapping vulnerability. So vulnerability that I was talking about at the start. Um, so there's a website here you can go to um, and there's a Google Maps sort of thing. So you can go in and um, look at your local area and um, it has areas with that are of high vulnerability, so that index is based on age, um, people with pre-existing health conditions, those sorts of things. And there's also this um, map of emergency ambulance call-outs. Um, so this, this kind of tool um, can work with, you can use this kind of vulnerability, vulnerability mapping tool to, sh to identify areas where there's lots of people that are vulnerable to heat exposure and then use other, other tools such as um, satellite remote sensing to identify areas of high heat exposure and um, use those kind of tools to identify priority areas of where you want to um, intervene with stormwater harvesting. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Andy. And as people think about uh, some questions they may have, I'll ask the first one. Um, there's a lot of information that you're producing uh, with the CRC. Um, what's the mechanism for getting that information out to the community to action, whether it be through local government, state government, or individuals? Um, we've got a couple of, well, as part of the CRC process, um, we have workshops a couple of times a year, but they are for um, industry partners, but we also do produce a blueprint uh, each year. Um, so the 2013 ones, I'm not sure when that's coming out, but it shouldn't be too far away. So um, that sort of tries to consolidate what we're learning um, 
uh, into a sort of a short, short brief, and that provides out. Um, we've also we're producing a a report that's kind of covers um, covers off a lot of the stuff I talked about, or a lot of the projects. So only a, sort of a progress report on the observational stuff. Um, but aside from that, I guess it's events like these um, um, that right. uh, are helpful. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Okay, I invite questions from the audience. Uh, Jeff Conlon, uh, thanks for that, Andy. Particularly in the um, providing sort of a, a, a more in-depth understanding of what's actually going on and what we really need to take into account. Um, one of the things that I was wondering about is that in um, the project where it's been pointed out we are really limited with vegetation in say the, the western part of Melbourne and we have that, uh, those heat situations and the physical constraints of the sites um, make it very hard at times to actually have vegetation. Um, looking at what some of the European cities are doing and they're going for non-vegetation, they're using shade cloth for shading and fogging as a strategy. Have you guys looked at that as part of your overall um, review of technologies and stuff? No, we haven't, um, we haven't really broadened what we've been looking at aside from the, the white roof stuff that I briefly showed then. Um, but in terms of sort of stormwater harvesting and um, irrigation is just going to be just, just one approach that to, to, to addressing these areas of high heat exposure. We need to really look at um, multiple approaches. Um, and in some cases, vegetation won't be the best, the best way to, to deal with uh, an uncomfortable location. So you're right, I think all of those options are going to need to be, to be uh, considered when we're, when we're trying to intervene in a place. Um, that's right, but we haven't really um, done any research under that sort of stuff. So maybe some of the, the microclimate modelling will be able to explore some of those things, um, hopefully. Yep. Hi Michael, uh, Darren Coglin. I heard a, st um, a stat from w uh, Vic Roads last week that a third, uh, all the water that falls off their main arteries and roads is a third of Melbourne's water supply. Now that's a lot of water. Um, does Monash do any research towards how do we, how much is actually running off? Has it been done in the past? Um, so I think there's been, as part of, what was the Ministerial Advisory Council to OLV did, or that preceded <coughs> OLV, did a lot of work around sort of a whole water balance for, for all of Melbourne um, that showed that over the whole of Melbourne there's generally um, as much runoff as, we, as water we consume anyway. Um, there are other parts of the um, CRC that are looking at um, better ways to actually capture and, and use that water. Um, so our work's pretty concentrated on the, on the climate aspects, yep. Daryl Brown from Me2 Design Lab. Thanks Andy for a really interesting talk. Um, it's always good to see what's happening on the, on the climate side of Thanks. things. I was particularly interested to see you were talking about the differences with the irrigation. You said you were more than doubling the amount of evapotranspiration with what you were doing out on the, yep. I think it was Footscray. Um, um, that was the green roof stuff, yep. Yep, yep. Um, just a question on that. Have you tried looking at street trees and streetscape rain gardens and how much they increase the evapotranspiration over and above what you would get just for a, you know, a standard verge or a, a curb sort of thing. I'd be interested to know how much. And my second question would be, have you had a look at the effects on the energy balance in terms of evapotranspiration and how much that affects how much energy is gained or lost through that process? Okay. Um, the first question, we've done a bit of work uh, out at Smith Street looking at trees that are in tree pits. Um, that's probably the closest stuff that we've done. Um, if you're coming to the stormwater conference in May. I've got a talk there. Um, just a plug for that. And that is looking at um, sort of the, the tree response to the amount of water that's, that's available. So um, we're not looking at the influence of the tree on the environment, but um, 
so having the tree pit there will change the, the, the soil moisture available to that tree and then we were actually doing measurements of transpiration, leaf scale transpiration from those trees and trying to link it to um, try and link it to the amount of soil moisture that was semi successful but come to the talk and you'll hear all about <laughs> it. Um, that's what I didn't want to talk about it today because yeah yeah. Um, so obviously so th further I think we're still working on that um, with that project uh, we're not quite there yet um, so we should be able to sort of get an idea of um, uh, the the, the, the total transpiration that we're getting from trees. Um, in, in <coughs> along with that, we've got a colleague in um, Leuven in um, Belgium who's got a climate model and has actually put these tree pits into his model and is irrigating them with a rainwater tank. And so through that, we'll, I think we'll definitely start to be able to answer that question. So we're, we're getting there. Um, with the energy balance, I think that's... So that's sort of what we were doing with the, the green roof stuff. Um, um, and I think, again, with the modelling, we'll start to see, um, we'll start to see the changes that we get um, from sort of at that local scale. So um, there's lots of models out there that work at that, that real local scale, neighbourhood scale. And so we can, through that model, we'll be able to change the, change the different land surface characteristics, so amount of vegetation and then how much that translates in, into evapotranspiration. So I think we're, we're working towards that, yep. Um, it was more of an obs observation um, about my experiences with um, climate sensations and um, I play a lot of golf and um, y you, f you see a lot of different sensations on the golf course and that's total green infrastructure and um, of course shady trees are, are great. You get out onto the open fairway, grass, it can be quite unbearable under there when you get so much evapotranspiration happening. You notice it a lot when um, it particularly intense heat, uh, heat headed days um, and particularly where there's a lot of water in those areas. Um, have, you got, have you been thinking about in the green infrastructure areas where you can actually have those um, tolerances and um, as a consequence to trying to promote green infrastructure that there's some issues associated with that as well? By lots more irrigation, lots more water, water around, there's a risk that we could increase um, evapotranspiration and not, not e that's what we're aiming to achieve, <laughs> increase humidity um, and that's, it's that influence on thermal comfort and that's also why we're not just focusing on air temperatures and looking at thermal comfort as well because those, that thermal comfort measure um, includes that humidity aspect. Um, uh, I think we're still working on that as well. Um, general, I think what, from what I've seen, the benefit you get in the temperature reduction outweighs any adverse effect from the increase in humidity. Um, and I think, again, with this modelling approach that we're taking, I think we'll be able to um, quantify that a lot, a lot more. Um, but it's still, I think um, it would be good if we could do a bit more focus on people's experiences and connecting that with what's going on with their environment. But there's not a whole lot of, it's really difficult to get a large number of surveys across a whole range of conditions. Um, but it's an area that we should focus on a lot more. Just wondering what uh, level of importance or how much reduction in herb urban heat does the albedo, uh, like if you have a high albedo, how much influence does that have on ur um, urban heat island? And they've got a second part depending on your answer. <laughs> um, what it kind of depends what you're comparing it to. Um, well, my, I'm a... I'm not known for diplomacy, and I'm an engineer, so I'm not known for aesthetics either. Yep. Why don't we just uh, make it compulsory to everybody have white roofs? That's a great idea. <laughs> 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 well, I think, I think in terms of that green roof, um, containing it to that green roof versus uh, white roof argument, um, I think the white roof is, in terms of... Uh, heat exposure is providing a larger benefit. 
um, you have to irrigate the roof um, to try before you start m matching those white roof benefits. Um, there's a few caveats around that, but I won't go into it. Um, but what we, but you don't get the model benefits that you get from a green roof with a white roof. So you don't get the stormwater runoff benefits um, or the or the amenity benefits of that. Um, the the thing that we've sort of thinking is if you if you painted it white, um, it might be better to anyway from the thermal comfort point of view to um, bring the water to the ground in the tank and use it to irrigate a tree. And so then you're actually um, taking that, bringing that benefit down. You're getting a rooftop benefit and a, a street level benefit. I've actually got an answer to Alex because I've heard that question before about why don't we just... <laughs> um, it actually has an impact on ecology to do with insects if you end up painting all the roofs white and then with, the, with um, artificial light at night, apparently, yeah, so they're, while sometimes we think of, um, yeah, that sounds like a good idea, mm. there sometimes can be repercussions elsewhere. That's really interesting. I would have never thought of that. <laughs> All right, I think we'd better wrap it up there. Can you please help me thank our fantastic speakers for tonight, Rod and Andy. Thanks, gents. And before you go, I just wish to uh, thank again the sponsors for tonight, Department of Health, putting on such a, a fantastic venue for us. Um, we've got Melbourne Water for our gold sponsorship. Appreciate their support always. Our fantastic speakers, Andy and Rod, tonight. Thank you very much for that. The audience, for your participation and your very passionate questions. And thank you to our video audience. I hope you enjoyed the, this evening's session. Good night. <laughs>